And I welcome you to this session, which is part of a broader, long-term, collaborative project with CTRL, the Office of the Provost, and the Office of Campus Life to help create diverse and inclusive classroom environments. Today's topic, addressing student stress and mental health, is a part of that larger conversation. Our goal today is to focus on strategies. These are complex issues, and we want to help identify and provide ways to address students' mental health that supports academic learning. Some of those suggestions will come from our panelists and some from each of you. We understand how challenging these issues can be and realize that there is no easy agreement on solutions or approaches. So you may hear things today that you agree with. There may be things that you don't agree with, and that's perfectly fine. After the panel presentation, the majority of our time together will be for a Q&A. But if we don't answer all of your questions today, please feel free to email us at CTRL or to email me, Marilyn Goldhammer, Goldham, without the ER, at American.edu, and we'll do our best to direct you to the resources or the response that you need. Let me introduce our panel. Starting on the left, Carol Weisbrod <clears throat> is a, a professor emerita from the Department of Psychology. She worked at AU for 42 years. So she knows our students and our university extremely well, and we're honored that she came back to join us today. She was the former director of clinical training and maintains a private psychology practice, and she will speak about development of the college age student. Next to Carol is Tracy Calandrillo, who is the director of the AU Counseling Center, and will also share her perspective on mental health trends and impacts and the protective and risk health factors of college. Sitting next to Tracy is Marianne Huger Thompson, who is the Senior Director of the Academic Support and Access Center, and she will speak about interventions and strategies specific to our students at American University. So you can see we have a lot of expertise, and all of you have things to contribute, so we'll go ahead and get started. Carol? Part of the discussion, I thought it would be. In, you can't. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I thought it would be important to talk about the normative, non-pathological development of 18 to 25-year-olds, and I'll do this in about five minutes. So please forgive me for any over. Still can't. Closer. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, I'll do this in about five minutes, so forgive the oversimplification, but I did think it would help to know where students are in their development as they come to college <clears throat> and how their developmental accomplishments and challenges might affect them in their lives and as learners. These issues will inform, as Tracy and Mary Ann will talk about, effective strategies for engaging and dealing with students. To start, psychologists in the last decade have defined the construct of emerging adulthood, not adolescence on the one hand and not mature adulthood on the other, as that period of cluster of years in between those two formative parts of development. In industrialized countries, this development period involves individuals typically between the ages of 18 and 25. What are some of the macro factors influencing this emerging adulthood? One, implicit in the concept of emerging adulthood is that information-based economy, in information-based economies, there's agreement that there is a need to obtain more education post-secondary school. 
A second factor that, in, that defines some of what goes on during this period of time that has changed in the last 50 years is the invention of birth control, which has contributed to delaying the median marriage and subsequent pregnancy age to at least the late 20s. Both this need for information and the later move to marriage and the start of family is associated on the positive side as a period, and it can have its risks, of exploration, self-discovery, self-development, lack of desire to be prematurely locked into commitment, and for many, a period of instability and uncertainty. This period of emerging adulthood involves a cultural belief system that values individual development over obligations and duties to others, especially family. Again, the features of this age period, <clears throat> as I've described them, occur mainly in industrialized cultures where economic interdependence among family members is not as necessary for survival. The features of this period also may vary depending on cohorts that participate in higher education with different goals. For example, seeing education as a way to security and a job versus seeing this period of time as a period for self-exploration. What are some of the micro factors that influence emerging adulthood? And again, here, there are a lot of individual differences in the rate of development and accomplishment. During this period of time, cognitive working memory continues to develop, but is not finished developing. The ability to imp inhibit impulses continues to develop, but also is not finished developing. Rather than being totally achieved, college <clears throat> age involves an emerging but not total accomplishment of executive function skills, such as anticipation, planning, and follow through, <coughs> excuse me, all of which influence decision making and inhibition of unwanted behavior, not only about risk taking in areas such as substance, substance abuse and unprotected sex, but also in school related areas, such as, for example, planning to study, but at the last minute, friends and screens beckoning and throwing the plan to study out the window. So self-regulation, mood stability, attitudes, various identity explorations, and values are still in flux on average for most students of college age. The good news is that over this period of time, appropriate decision making that involves considering more than immediate outcomes increases, self-acceptance tends to increase, and more behavioral stability is achieved. Risk-taking on average drops, and this is very interesting, I think, when these emerging adults eventually marry, but interestingly enough, cohabitation doesn't have the same impact. So, Involvement in higher education is voluntary, although strongly encouraged in our culture. Students arrive after being in high school where attendance is mandatory and monitored, parents regulate, and as we know for this cohort, in many instances over hover, or hover, uh, perhaps limiting their children's uh, opportunity to develop autonomy. Also, students have grown up totally with technology and the expectation of quick response. Frustration tolerance is not always a strength in all the members of this cohort. They arrive at school, which can be a protective environment, but live with non-family members, create their own schedules, structure or don't structure their time, and are not as closely monitored. Some students manage this opportunity better than others. So what about students in higher education? Emerging adults acquire from professors skills that will enable them to participate in the modern economy. 
This involves knowledge, values such as reliability, and supportive motives such as self-sufficiency. I'm not sure how many, I know I wasn't taught this, but I'm not sure how many of us grew up in academia thinking beyond the important mission of teaching to impart knowledge, uh, knowledge and, and methodology in our classes. It's an interesting question to think about whether we as faculty were taught or even thought about the parts of the teaching learning process, such as enhancing student self-responsibility, self-sufficiency, and dealing with individual differences. If we did or thought it was important, an additional question would be how we would support these developments in our courses and in our meetings with students. So in summary, with the more open living and academic structure of the university, in contrast to the family of origin and the future family that will be formed that provide a different kind of structure and goal orientation, on average, emerging adults come to the university with emerging but not finished competencies <clears throat> that are associated with academic and personal achievement. Tracy and Marianne <clears throat> will talk about how emerging competencies and potential vulnerabilities may affect responsibility and performance in classes and strategies to address these issues. Thank you. I'm gonna stay seated. Are these mics on? Can everyone hear me? So I'm also going to uh, speak pretty broadly at this point of some overview issues. I imagine we'll talk more specifically in the question and answer period about um, things we might see in the counseling center, about how you could apply different skills or techniques in the classroom that we might talk about that we use just in general in terms of managing stress or distress for our students. So as Carol talked about, we have this very broad overview that I think is always helpful to start with about the developing brain of our traditional age, 18 to 22 year old undergraduate student, and also about some of the motivating factors that bring them to school. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, a lot of these factors were the same when I was in school or, or you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. What feels different now? And I think that's a valid question to ask, and you could probably ask 100 different mental health practitioners and college counseling centers, and we could all say, well, it's this one thing, because the truth is, it isn't just one thing. So what makes it really challenging when we try to think about what is, what is going on where there's so much more experience of distress or demand for mental health resources um, now versus 10 or 15 years ago. Um, first, I just want to start with some statistics. So our counseling center is part of a network called the Center for Collegiate Mental Health. Um, this is an organization that's been in existence for about 10 years. It's the largest data set of students who've utilized mental health resources that exists. So over 100,000 data points of, of individual clients is represented in this group from about 140 different universities. So we're talking about really rich, strong data to be looking at in terms of trends. And so one of the things that this group has noticed overall Nationally, there's been a 38% increase in demand for services at institutions across the country. So you, you are probably thinking, gosh, that, that seems like a lot, and it is, because if you think about um, the change in the enrollment on our campuses, the numbers haven't, haven't risen that high. So there's something that's going on that's, that's changed uh, significantly over the last 10 years. Um, just as a data point on our campus, and this may be a different final number by the end of the year, but our trend in that same amount of time is about a 42% increase. So we're certainly seeing the same shift on our campus as well. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about the protective and risk factors that uh, Carol mentioned, um, because when we think about the general tasks of development for the 18 to 22 year old, being in college is quite significantly a protective factor for young adults. And it's important to think about that because of the kinds of resources that are available on college campuses as compared to what's available 
in the community for individuals who are not part of a college environment and don't have access to these resources as being really a central piece to how we think about why and what we offer in terms of resources on our campus, okay? So imagine the protective factor of being able to be engaged with an institution, being able to go to a class every day, meet peers, um, engage with things that you're excited about that keep you future oriented. Those are all protective factors, okay? We can flip that around and think about the risk aspect of that, which is primarily focused on the challenge we all face sort of existentially, which is if I try and I don't succeed with something I really, really want, that doesn't feel very good, okay? So the, the risk factor being failing in a class or wishing you had a certain kind of internship and not getting that internship when your brain isn't fully developed to have a full ability to understand the future impact of that, it's going to be more of a significant distress than being able to have a perspective for, well, I, I did fail that one time, but it worked out really well for me and I was able to get another job that was a better fit. Many of us in the room might be able to draw on those experiences because we've, we're at a different place in our lives developmentally than the undergraduate student. So again, we want to think about the, the potential risk factor that is playing out in your classroom with a group of people whose ability to be resilient is essentially invisible to you when you first meet them, right? So you might think, wow, this student really seems to be taking in and, and doing really well with this information when in fact you, you have no idea what else is going on for that person and the ways in which they cope with that. And then someone else, you think, gosh, it seems like it's very hard for this person to manage their distress and they're, they're acting this out in the classroom. Um, yes, you see some of that, but the truth is there's, there's many other pieces of mental health that don't necessarily play out in ways that are easily understood either by you or by the individual who's experiencing them. So we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. I want to talk, too, about um, the impact of... Um, resilience and the changes that this is a trend that I think is talked about quite a bit. One of the first points I'd make is that that 38% increase in demand for services isn't because there's been a 38% decrease in students' ability to be resilient. There are probably many factors that play into that. So when we think about how we, how we can maximize students' ability to manage the daily stress that every single college student goes through by definition of being in college, we want to think beyond just let's, let's fix them so they can take it better. Okay, We can talk in more detail about that, but I think that's a, a frame I'd like for you to explore. And then the last piece related to that resilience is we like to think in the Counseling Center about stress as being a given, but distress being the more problematic expression of that stress, right? College is stressful. Every single person who has to take in the kind of information that college students do in a full load of courses, that's just a lot to put on your brain. Being alive is stressful. You all, I'm imagining, didn't have the easiest time getting into the university today. That stress we all learn how to manage. So stress in and of itself, not a problem. But when, you, when that stress compounds or gets um, built into a person feeling that they can't cope with the stress, we start to see that displayed as distress. And that's when we start to see problems that we get more concerned about in, in terms of the furthest end of that would be a person's inability to keep themselves safe, okay? So when we think about that in a broad way, we always want to think about how do we keep people in that healthy level of stress. And so one of the things Mary Ann's going to focus on is some just basic broad things you can think about in the classroom. We like to think of this as setting your students up for success in a way. Um, and then we can talk in more specific about how you might help them manage that distress that they're playing out. So we're really glad that so many of you came here. And I was thinking a little bit about why, did, why are so many people interested in hearing about this topic. And I'm reflecting on the conversations that I've had with many of you who are faculty members about individual students. And there are three, three emotions or feelings that I've heard you that come across on the phone very, very apparently. First is really wanting to help students and sympathy for their individual situations. The next is a frustration with the requests for modifying very carefully designed courses and syllabi that you've thought about. Um, and the last thing is this desire for equity and feeling that you want to create a fairness in the classroom and a fairness to other students while also being sympathetic to individual student situations. So 
In thinking about that, and I'm thrilled to be able to give you some solutions to these very weighty um, emotions, um, I think that the easiest way to come at this is the concept of universal design. So very concretely, the idea of universal design is that if we design environments, whether they're physical um, or learning environments, that work for everyone, or at least close to as everyone as we can get, then we have fewer needs for modifications. Um, so concretely, a curb cut. That really works well for and is essential for a person in a wheelchair, right? But when I'm pushing a baby stroller, it's really, really frustrating when that curb cut doesn't line up with where the crosswalk is. So, or if you're pull, pushing a suitcase to go to the metro. We all use this thing. It's designed for one population, but when done well, it now works for everyone, okay? So that's one way, and there, a field has sprung out of that called universal design learning, universal design and teaching. So um, the, the suggestions, and I have three of them for you, are really coming from that frame of mind, and, I, and I'm sure you can think of others. But the idea is that if you set up your course to be universally designed, if you think about a lot of these issues and what works for everyone, um, rather than the very few square pegs that we have for our square boxes, um, you'll be, you will also be set up for success for handling all of these requests. Because believe me, when I'm on the phone with you, I feel for you. We're asking you to basically create independent studies for four of the 30 students in your course by the end of the semester, and it's a lot of work. So hopefully work on the front end will help with this. Um, so one concrete idea. Set up your syllabus in a way that sets you up to be able to address issues that might come up in the semester. So put in the syllabus ways that you can be flexible and alternatives for assignments. Um, I, I teach as an adjunct at GW, and an example of, the, of this that I use is if a student needs to miss class, I teach adult students, they need to miss class for all sorts of reasons. I have them write a reading reflection on the um, readings that we covered that night and to talk to someone else in the class about their thoughts of what we discussed in class. And so they also have that um, that human interaction on it, and I ask them to include that in the reflection to me. So I'm not saying, sure, miss class, no problem, but I'm also not necessarily needing them to tell me why they missed class. I'm not needing to get into those weeds. I've figured out an alternative that, to me, meets my learning outcomes. Um, one that I've seen here that works quite well also is when it's an exam-based course, having three exams and the faculty member drops the lowest grade. So they don't need to know why the student is needing to drop that last grade. And so when we're on the phone with them saying the student is not um, going to be able to take this last exam, could we extend it? And they say, oh, well, I'm actually looking at my grade book, and they've done quite well on the first two exams. So they could miss this third exam drop that one and then take their final. So if you set up these systems in your syllabus ahead of time, you're just able to tell students about the options that are already available to them rather than having to come up with a whole other set of options at the last minute for a student. Um, the next piece that is really helpful for students with disabilities, students with mental health concerns, but actually all students, and I know we're talking about this a lot anyway, is giving students early feedback and giving them often feedback. Lots of times when we're talking with faculty and they're saying, what should I do for this student? Um, the best piece of advice I can give them is say, to give them a realistic assessment of where they're actually doing in your class so that they can make an educated determination on what they need to do. So by saying, don't worry, you'll be fine, it will all work out, that's the kindest thing to say, but it gives the student no data to make a decision on. So by saying, you know what, you've missed all of these things, I'm happy to work with you on extending the deadlines. I'm worried about your ability to finish these three things. So I think you should go and meet with your academic advisor and talk through what your options are for your courses. That's a harder conversation to have. It's much easier in the moment to say, don't worry, it will all work out. I'm sorry you're crying. Here's some tissues. That's easier in the moment, but it gives us, when then we're advising students, it gives us very little to go on um, to help them make thoughtful decisions. So um, if you can give them feedback, think about the deadlines, when's the uh, withdrawal deadline, make sure that students have good feedback ahead of time and so that they know how they're doing in your class so they can decide to withdraw from the class if they're going to need to by the deadline. And then also talk to them about problem solving skills. So um, saying abstract things like you can complete the work or um, that don't worry, we'll make it up. For a student who's really stressed out, that's so abstract and they actually don't know when, how that gets accomplished. But instead, if you can break it down with them and say, all right, you've missed these three Blackboard posts and you've missed this reflection that we did in class. 
here's where I think your priority should be. When do you realistically think you can finish these things? So if you get in the weeds with them a little bit, and again, you're not having to talk to them about their mental health <sighs> issues. So it doesn't mean that you have to engage as a counselor. We actually don't want that. Um, but if you can engage with them on the academic side of this, of talking about what they actually have missed, it's really helpful. Oftentimes students will say to us, um, I I'm failing the class, I've missed everything, I haven't gone in forever. Sometimes that's true. But about half the time when we talk to the faculty member and find out what they're missing, the faculty member says, they're missing two Blackboard posts and they've missed two classes. If they can turn this around, they can make it. But the student is feeling this weight that they're so sunk that they don't know how to re-engage with you. So if you can talk to them about problem solving skills, help them make the abstract more concrete um, and giving them the feedback earlier, that's helpful. And then the last thing is to be clear about what your expectations are. And I do want to just underline that you are allowed to have expectations. So um, <laughs> a mental health crisis, an accommodation letter from the Academic Support and Access Center does not mean this trump card of finish the class however you please, okay? You should have expectations and you should hold your students to the expectations and it should be a dialogue with the student and whatever staff members um, that you think would be helpful for you in that conversation. But you should be clear about what the expectations are. Um, you can ask students, and this, when I work with students, I always ask students to do this. You can ask the student to draft their plan to get back on track in the class. You don't have to be the one that does that. And I often tell students it's like a used car negotiation. You say what works best for you. You say, I'd buy it for this. And then the faculty member can come back and say, uh, I'm going to need it a week earlier. Could you do it for them? But then the conversation has started. So feel free to put that on the student, and there's a lot of staff members that are here to help them figure out how to make that plan, um, or you can help them with that in your office hours, um, but you don't have to both be flexible and come up with the plan. But if you can at least tell them what your expectations are, that gets us halfway there. Um, and, th and then also help them to prioritize which of the assignments are the most salient or the most time sensitive. So to say, I'd really like you to finish the presentation because that's with group, uh, with your group. So why don't we not worry about the final paper? That's easier to complete than incomplete. But if you can keep your group work on time, that's really, I, I think we can keep you on track in the class. So um, th those types of things I think will not only be better for your students with the mental health concerns um, or the accommodations for various disabilities, but I think it'll also help all of you because we hear the stress in your voice when you're trying to figure this out. Um, and I, I actually think they'll be better for even your students who are sailing through. Okay, we're going to take questions and we'll start here, yes. Uh, yeah, I had a question uh, for Tracy about the um, utilization uh, stats increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, since the epidemiological studies show all psychological disorders are grossly undertreated, uh, do you see this as like destigmatization and it's great that they're coming in for help, or do you think the actual prevalence of, of problems has increased? So that was a great question. The, the question focused on um, prevalence data of mental health concerns and why we think this increase is, is happening. Um, I have a couple thoughts about that. The first one is I think destigmatization is, has, has made a significant impact. Um, we have, in terms of the history for our students of uh, prior mental health treatment before coming to college, a fairly significantly higher number of our students have received services previously than the, natu the national norm numbers. Um, there's probably some reasons for that. I think one is that we have students who might have the resources that they could have gotten treatment earlier. Um, but I think destigmatization really allows us to do our jobs well. It allows people who need treatment to think about that as a possibility. That being said, I think there have been some trends in higher education mental health that probably contribute to that. Um, for those of you who don't know, in 2009, the Garrett Lee Smith Act was passed, which provides a significant amount of funding to universities to do suicide prevention work. And while we have not had that grant on our campus, that has greatly increased the attention that's out there just in the general public around the risk of mental health concerns and suicide in particular for young people. So a lot of our students are already thinking about these issues uh, just generally, but then also for themselves. So I think that's a factor. I think also universities have gotten better and better at the preventative work and the general 
care resources. So we have the care network on our campus. So we're doing our jobs well, which means we have a lot more demand because the people who probably need to see us are more likely to be referred to us or come to us themselves. I guess my question is for Carol. Uh, when you were talking, you, you said this is kind of the normative uh, industrialized country um, emerging adulthood phase. Uh, mm -hmm. What would, what should we have in mind for folks not coming from that background or what's the range of, of issues we might be dealing with outside of that? Um, <clears throat> I think you're talking to the mic. Yeah. I think that there's not a lot of data on that, but <clears throat> there's general agreement among students of this age that what they would like to attain is autonomy, financial independence, and a path forward. And there's not much difference against, um, across um, different groups on those goals. In some Asian American groups, there's also the goal of taking care of family as uh, an endpoint socialization goal. Um, <clears throat> what is known is that when it is not an industrialized country, that that period of self-exploration gets narrower because of demands for work, for family. And um, so that's mainly the difference that's described. Yes. Yes, I wondered if you had some bibliography or suggested readings. I've read a couple of things lately that really made me rethink uh, some of the things I do in class. One of them is a book by MIT professor of communications, Sherry Turkle, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age, really gives a lot of interesting information. And there's a section both on education and the workplace. And it's her research is one reason that, at least in my practicum, it's a device-free environment in the classroom. Um, another one is My Freshman Year, which is an older book by a professor who, from a land-grant institution who became a freshman and did an um, ethnological study of it. Um, and really helped me see a lot more from the student point of view. So I wondered, A, whether you'd heard of either of those, and two, whether there were, or B, whether there were other things that you would recommend. Thank you. Um, thank you. We do have copies of Sherry Turkle's books in CTRL. The other I'm not familiar with. But if anyone has recommendations of resources, please send them to me or send them to CTRL, and we'll compile a list and figure out a way to get it back to all of you. So thank you for that. Recently, I've had a, a number of, uh, a few women who have been sexually assaulted. Uh, and has there been an increase in sexual assaults on campus? And what is the best way to handle uh, young women after uh, they've reported this to, uh, to the faculty member? They've already reported to the counseling center, I assume. They've told me that. Uh, but what is the best way for the faculty member to handle it? especially a male faculty member. Okay. Tracy, uh, Marianne, do you want to address Sure, that? I can um, talk about this from the Dean of Students Office perspective, and Rob Horatsky, the Dean of Students at your table, will keep me honest here. Um, <laughs> so yes, our numbers have increased. Rob, do, can you speak to the? Yeah, I, I would actually say that the, uh, I would say that the numbers probably of reports, right. in fact, has increased. And that's because of visibility uh, on campus nationally and so forth. Uh, do we believe the number of incidents in and of itself has increased? Uh, I would say no. I think we, we're seeing a greater increase in reporting. Right. So, so with that, um, it gives me a great time to introduce this resource card that I put a bunch of on all of your tables. Um, enough so that you don't have to just take one. You can take several of them, uh, and that way you can have them in your office. But at the very bottom of that, there's information about the vi victim advocates on campus. One thing that's important to remember with sexual assault is the reporting requirements that the university has. So while usually you can keep 
um, things fairly private in your office when you're talking to someone. We don't want you to keep things um, completely to yourself if there's a risk um, factor. Obviously, we want you to tell the dean of students' office about that through the care network. But with sexual assault, if someone reports to you that they've been sexually assaulted, they've seen something happen, they've done it themselves, you actually have to report that. And so what is important to do when you feel like that disclosure is about to happen with a student, maybe they're, they're being kind of secretive or they're saying that something's going on with them and they really, they may not want to tell you or you're the first person that they're telling this, that kind of thing. You may want to stop them and say, let me explain the difference to you between privacy and confidentiality. And I will keep things private, but I'm going to confer with my colleagues about this because I want to be able to give you the best resources. And there are also some things I have to tell people about. But there are confidential resources on campus, and I'm happy to walk you to them so that you feel like you can tell whatever you want, and this is not going to be reported necessarily if that's not what you want. Counseling Center is um, a great place to do that. The victim advocates are probably uh, the other great place to do that. Um, the health center is another option. Um, and those and are the, confidential resources, so we're not required to, to go through that same reporting process. Right. So if the student is telling you about this, I'm assuming they're either telling you because they, they need an adult to talk to about something that's really confusing that's happening in their life, or they're needing an academic modification. So in both of those cases, I would say please get the Dean of Students Office involved in that so that we can help you, um, both with getting them to adult resources that are trained in how to, how to manage sexual assault and make sure that they, um, the student is the best cared for. We have really strong resources here on this campus. But then also so that we can help manage the um, academics for the student on a whole because they may feel really comfortable talking to you about it and saying, can we move this paper? There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. But they may have other faculty member that they're really intimidated by. So if we can find out from you what's going on with their academics and we don't need to know the details, we're able to then contact the rest of their faculty members and talk first we'd obviously talk to the student and figure out what the student needs and then we can provide and you guys have all gotten these emails from the Dean of Students office these veiled something serious is going on with this person <laughs> so we're asking for some flexibility and that's our way of really being able to keep the students privacy um, but be able to tell you we have verified that something serious is going on here and there's a uh, there's a reason to be flexible Did that answer the question well enough So I can speak to some suggestions from the just the support aspect of what you're saying, not so much the transactional what to do next in terms of making sure that the university knows about it. Um, also the prevalence rates piece, I would go back to the same theme we talked about before. I think the prevalence rate is roughly about the same. I'm saying that from somebody who's been doing this work for many, many years. So this has always been a significant issue. What's changed is it's part of the national conversation. And I think the resources are out there in a way so there's, there's stated destigmatization for people who've experienced sexual assault. And I think that's empowered people to come forward, which is fantastic uh, from my perspective. Um, so I would say thinking about how you would be caring and responsive to any student who's talking to you about something and assuming it must be difficult for them to do so, but that they've trusted you with that information. Um, be thoughtful about the resources that are available to that person. And from my perspective, anything you do that empowers that person to seek help or support, especially support that can be with them as they're going through a process if they decide that they want to do something more formal with, the, with reporting their experience is important. So connecting them with us in the Counseling Center. The Victim Advocate is a terrific resource that also allows that person to have some choice and decision over what happens next. But as Marianne said, as a part of this institution, you're required to talk to somebody to make sure that the report is made. So hopefully those two pieces don't come um, at cross, at, at odds with each other. Um, but I would just say <coughs> being a supportive part of that person getting connected is probably the best you can do for them. Um, yeah, I appreciated the panel's comments about um, students and the potential lack of problem solving. But I would like it if you could talk a little bit more about what I'm seeing a lot of as a full-time professor who's teaching primarily freshmen, mm -hmm. which is a sort of learned and accepted helplessness. Mm -hmm. I receive many emails along the lines of, I literally, this is an email I got this week, was I spilled tea on my laptop. I cannot order my books. Okay. <laughs> and, 
And at first I was like, what do these two things have to do with each other? I had to sort of noodle it through. And okay, she wants to order her books online. And because her computer is not working, now believes she has no way to access the internet. That was, you know, and so I had to sort of, you know, and I was very polite and I was kind and I helped troubleshoot with her. But this is something that as a faculty member with many responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm getting inundated with mm -hmm. these kinds of requests. And I'm wondering, one, where is this coming from? And, and two, what's the best strategy? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, I can I can speak to what uh, you're talking about in terms of it feels like there's some trends around the expectation of what a faculty member's role is in troubleshooting things that happen like spilling tea on your laptop. Um, and I'm not saying that I have the answer to this per se, but when we think about the the problem solving skills that we all need to develop in life and the opportunity to develop those problem solving skills, we have a whole range in our students of what they're able to figure out and things they can't. Um, my, I have a 13 year old and his ability to manage technology, you know, to be able to use an app or uh, use different things on a computer, you know, completely eclipses mine. But he would have no idea how to write a check for example. And so I bring that up as an analogous to there, there's likely a reason they look to you for that. It doesn't mean that you are the solution for them, but there may be a way in which, and this might be a, you know, something you do with how you talk in your syllabus or when you're talking to them about the, the readings that you have, um, to direct them to the solution. So in this particular example, this seems like a, just a mismatch. Right, like you aren't in fact the person who can fix their laptop, but they're looking to you because they want to know, I'm guessing, um, what does my professor think I, I need to do to, um, you know, so what's the significance of this for me being able to get my work done? I don't think right. I mean, my question is really more about the learn helplessness. The learn helplessness than piece. An actual example that was really just a random example oh, that okay. did so, happen. I'm more concerned about the learned helplessness and the degree to which students need <laughs> that sort of assistance. Mm -hmm. So. I guess my, well, also I want to point out something funny about that story is that they were writing an email. So they'd obviously found the internet somehow, but. <laughs> oh, I didn't. Um, <laughs> um, but I guess to engage with the student, I think when we are so busy, we go into problem solving mode for the student. So we'd say the library has computers. So I've solved your problem. That's, that's an easier email again. It's an easier way to do it. Instead, I think. You know, one thing is you don't have to write back right away. So I think when a lot of us are stressed, we think, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. And we think of all the worst case scenarios. And then, and this is what happens to all of us at two in the morning when you wake up. And then when you've had some time to think about it, you realize there is a solution to this. So I think one thing is that you could wait a little bit to write back to the person and maybe they will figure it out in the meantime. Um, but then to have the conversation, and this of course better done in person, but to say, I. I'm really struck by this email that you sent um, in that you, you had access, you know how to find the internet, right? Um, but something else was going on here. Talk to me about that. Or um, why, why did you look to me to solve this tea situation? Because um, I, I, I don't like it when tea gets built on my computer, but I don't know that I'd go calling my, I'm trying to think of an equivalent, my boss. <laughs> about that, right? Um, so to kind of dig into that and have that conversation with them about where do you, th where, where is this striking you? Because as you said, you teach first year students and they are, they are used to telling, a lot of them, telling their mom or dad, I've got a problem, fix it. Um, and this is a new world. So I think helping them reflect on that would be helpful. I want to just I one, think, I want to add I one think thing. You, Go ahead, Carol. you raise an important point of how much you want to get into it, mm -hmm. and how much time you have, and should you, and um, it's a difficult position to be in, because I think what you're saying is true. A lot of these kinds of problems were fixed historically, and the student didn't have to engage them or deal with the frustration or have the patience to see it through. So it's, a, it's kind of an individual decision about how much do I want to get into it when I'm busy. It's hard. I want to add one, one other comment to that. One thing that can be helpful, especially if you're working with freshmen, 
is to anticipate that you're going to get some of these questions because they're first year mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. Thinking about what Carol said, and one of the reasons we were so thrilled that Carol was willing to join us today was to give you this sort of overview of development and realizing that especially our underclassmen are still developing these skills. So someone, and sometimes it ends up being us, have to help them selectively. You can't, we can't do it all. I always say to new faculty when we do orientations, pick one skill that you want to work on in your class. But one way to deal with this too is being proactive, knowing that this is going to happen at the start of the semester. Say, let's talk a little bit about what mm -hmm. happens when. Mm -hmm. Your computer's not working. There's this thing called OIT. You each have computers, share. When is it appropriate to contact me? How soon will I be? So you kind of go through some of the scenarios and you get to do that based on you. Because we each have different things that will have us thinking, just like you're saying now, what is this email? We all get the ones, too, that say, thank you for understanding when we're not feeling so understanding. So everyone has their thing. I would recommend talking about that at the very start of the semester and including it in the syllabus. These are times when you go to OIT. These are times when you, because they don't know the resources. And then little by little, you can pull back and remind them, check page four on the syllabus. There's your answer. Thanks for letting me know. Bye. <laughs> Other questions in the back? Scott. Hey, uh, my name's Scott Talon. I teach in SOC, and I also happen to live on campus in Anderson Hall. And what I've noticed in the past three years there is how incredibly complex and overloaded students are. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I could first get into college today or survive it. Uh, and I think it's a lot to do with the internships and the expectations. And then this other part that I happen to also teach is social media. I think there's a lot here with looking at other people's curated lives that look so good that makes people feel bad. And I'm going to keep jumping around, so feel free to ignore or address any or all. Um, sometimes students are so open and sharing, they will literally say, I'm having a crisis today which is partly good, they're reaching out, but blows my mind, right, mm -hmm. that it's public. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part is, I think the stuff in class where they're missing assignments is the easy part. I think the tougher one is if they're completing everything, they're not really active engage, mm -hmm. how do then we find out and check in? And this all means more for us to do, especially on an interpersonal basis on top of this. And then want to dovetail this into maybe a question about what do you think of more and more mindfulness and meditation as a way for that could help some of the students some of the time, as opposed to the formal stuff, question mark. Well, you made a lot of our points for us, Scott, so thank you for that. Um, I strongly resonate with the factor you mentioned about the expectations that students place on themselves or that our culture places on them. I also, I don't know if I could make it through college today. Um, I had the benefit of doing it when there wasn't an internet, and so my entire life wasn't being posted, or I wasn't feeling like I was supposed to post it out there. So when you think about the development of a, a resilient person, you learn that your insides are not the same thing as someone else's outsides. So someone else's curated Facebook page is not a, a full reflection of that person, and nor is it this, that you need to live up to that. When you're 18, you might not have the ability to see things that way. So I actually would suggest that it's on all of us to be as not that you need to tell your students everything about yourselves, but I think our students really appreciate when we can kind of acknowledge and, and validate for them how challenging it can be to navigate everything. You know, I didn't have an internship my freshman year. I turned out okay. You might not say it that way to them, but I, I really think you would be amazed if you could hear their assumptions about what they believe to be true about, about all of us in terms of how we didn't struggle or how we must have always been this great. And the reality is we're all human beings and, and we got through adversity in ways that could be really helpful. So um, to speak to the mindfulness piece, um, that's a, a huge trend for, for colleges and universities. And stress management, mindfulness, techniques that allow people to self-regulate are incredibly helpful and beneficial. They're also really important for us to not just have you come to the counseling center individually and, and receive that training. So it's one of the reasons why we make sure we reserve a fair amount of our resources that we can use more broadly. We have a, a drop-in. You don't have to be a client of the counseling center stress management mindfulness group every week. 
Um, there's a pilot project that was created um, called Mindful Mondays that was done by a couple of, of advisors. You've probably heard of that. So ways that we can get this out to the student body. And mindfulness is something that is actually very broad. It doesn't have, some students are like, oh, I don't want to do yoga. I'm not interested in that. It's really every, every person who's able to manage their distress has a mindfulness skill set, right? So we want to try to really broaden this as much as we can and, and try to mitigate that piece of, I've got to be just like this other person who's doing all the things that I think they're doing when in fact they're really not. So. I, I can speak to the um, uh, quietness in class or the disengagement in class piece. Um, so one of the things you really want to look at is, is this a change in behavior? So is this just a person who is uncomfortable talking in class? Then I would say the answer to that is more of this universal design, so provide more means of assessment. So provide ways that you're assessing people in writing and presentation and engagement and providing options for engagement on Blackboard because that's often easier for some students um, to do. So if that's their nature, that's one thing. If this is a change in behavior, maybe you've talked to the academic advisor and said, I, it's something just doesn't seem right about this, then that's more of a concern and I would, I would submit a care report or talk to the advisor or another staff member about what's going on with the student. Hi, uh, my name is Alyssa Margolin. I'm a professor in the Health Studies Department. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for that question too. I wanted to just jump in on the mindfulness and meditation piece. Um, I just presented with a colleague of mine about that at the Aaron Farron Conference um, and we've been sort of piloting in our classes, all of our classes over the last semester, a bit of mindfulness and meditation in every class is sort of two minutes to 10 minutes, kind of depending, and gotten incredible feedback about it. Um, and I, I am thrilled, I'm new to the campus, I just started here last semester, but I'm thrilled to hear how much is already going on about this, that Mindful Mondays and there's the Wednesday meditation, and I mean, there's a lot of interest and a lot of momentum already, and <coughs> seemingly from my end of like, you know, 150 students so far, a lot of re receptivity on their part, so um, I, I am happy to talk more with anybody about sort of some easy ways to build that into your your day to day or hopefully we'll do some more of that but I think it's a really helpful piece and I would plug that it's not just for our students but to have a mindfulness coming into the classroom and a mindfulness about all of this I mean this is cultivating mindfulness about the classrooms into which we step <laughs> and sort of just taking a moment sometimes for ourselves to pause and breathe and before we take in our, all of our sort of crazy hectic stress and then sort of launch that onto our students because they're totally picking up on all of that too, so, yeah. Thank you, Alyssa. Other questions? Yes, Meg? Exam, is it not? Exam anxiety? So I've had students who start taking an exam and then mm -hmm. about five minutes into it, burst into tears. And mm -hmm. so I guess strategies from anyone from the panel about what to do in that moment mm -hmm. and maybe some universal design <laughs> ideas about what to do to help mm -hmm. everyone. Yeah. I'll start with the what to do in that moment piece of it and then Marianne can talk about the universal de design. Hopefully they would dovetail. Um, and let me preface, of course, that there might be contextual reasons why some of what I'm suggesting might not work. But um, so anxiety, if you've never experienced significant anxiety symptoms, can be quite disruptive to your ability to perform, especially in a situation where you need to really use your higher level thinking like an exam. So as much as possibly want to try to disrupt the biological experience. So you may be work, it may be a situation with a student who already, they know they have an anxiety situation that they're used to managing and they can tell you, I just need to step out for a couple of minutes. Um, it's helpful to ask that. Do you have a way that you already cope with your anxiety? If they say yes and you believe that this is something that can be done, let them step out into the hallway, get a glass of water, and then check in with them to see if they're ready to resume the exam. Um, if it's a situation where the person can't communicate that to you or, or he or she doesn't know, you might suggest, let's, let's have you step out into the hall for a minute, if it's possible to do that. Um, and just encourage the person to put both feet on the ground sitting and to put their hands on their legs. What that does is change their body posture so that they can get more air into their body. Um, 
that's not going to necessarily resolve the anxiety right away, but it's going to help them to slow back down again. Um, and then after a few minutes is when you can maybe help them think about whether or not they can re resume the exam. And then Marianne, maybe you can talk about how you prepare for that in the universal design. Yeah, so a few things. Um, if it's something that the student has never had before, or maybe they've had it once years before, but they haven't seen this as a college need to be accommodated, there's this immediate thing, and Tracy's exactly right, there are things that you need to do to get the person safe and to change that actual situation. But I would say think about this as in a two-step process. One is deal with the immediate concern. Um, and it's great that you're thinking about it now because when, I'm sure when that happens in the classroom, you also are very stressed out, and right. so you're probably not doing your best thinking. So it's great that we have this opportunity when we, we're all full-on chicken to actually think <laughs> about it. Um, so I would say... Dealing with the immediate thing is the, the most important and not letting your mind go to the 10,000 other things that are going to have to happen to clean this up. Um, so letting the person feel safe in that moment and then the cleanup happens. And so one thing is I would trust the student. So I would say how much of the exam did you see? Um, and then, and to, as we think about what you're willing to risk here, I guess I would be willing to risk the student getting away with something, um, but but having them feel supported in, in that time, um, depending on the answer that they give you, that sort of thing. So you can make a decision on what you think an alternative should be in that scenario. It may be that they um, don't finish anything that day and that what you're requiring of them at, at that moment is to contact you again within 24 hours and so that you guys can start having a conversation um, about how this work is going to be made up. So I guess one of the pieces is not don't treat non-emergency room things like emergency rooms. The decision about the test doesn't have to happen in that moment. Um, and then in terms of the universal design, giving people multiple options to show their show their talents what they've learned so if the student says yeah there was something about that exam that I I don't know how I will actually be able to ever write that thing again and if you feel it depends on the course that you're teaching if it's a writing course they need to write the exam because you need to grade their writing if it's another type of course, think about it really in your heart and think about it pedagogically. Could this be done in an oral exam in your office? Could this be done other ways? So um, you should think about what are you trying to evaluate? What are you trying to have them learn? And then see if there are alternatives. And then I would say going forward, they should absolutely meet with the Academic Support and Access Center because then an accommodation can be set up. So that's a proactive step. So that that way the student is having that dialogue with you at the beginning of the semester knowing this might be an anxiety provoking situation for me, how can we on the front end figure out how to make this work um, so that you're not having to deal with this in this like emergency setting? To follow up, I wanna ask a question about anxiety. Do you have suggestions about how faculty can determine when students are anxious by nature? Things that students might say or do that lead us to believe you're dealing with an anxious student. Well, so, yeah, we, we, we don't walk around with a sign, none of us, that says, this is what I do when I get distressed, right? Um, I think partly what you're speaking to, Marilyn, is the difficulty in determining, is what I'm seeing here something I need to be concerned about, or is this part of the sort of trait of this individual that anxiety is what they go to when they get stressed out? Well, I would say your best tool is your relationship with your student. And some of your classes are going to lend themselves more easily to you being able to establish some understanding of your students, and some are not. You know, if you are in a huge lecture class, that's more difficult. Um, but start by thinking about but maybe a default of, I'm wondering if there, this person is stressed out right now, right? We all have been stressed before, and we can think about what are our go-to ways of managing that stress. For some people, anxiety is one of the things that happens for them when they get distressed. So anxiety in some ways is a relatively straightforward impact on us because it's a very biological experience to be anxious, okay? Um, your heart rate elevates, your blood goes away from your cerebral cortex to other parts of your body because you're having a reaction that says, I've got to make sure I survive in this moment. So when you're in a classroom situation and you're a student and you're trying to take in information, that's, that's not going to be a great way to be able to take in learning. So if you think about it from that perspective, start by developing a relationship with that person, and then 
you don't need to go into all the ins and outs and personal pieces about their life history to be able to say, I'm wondering if you're feeling pretty anxious right now. Are you aware of the resources that are here on campus that can be helpful to you? Um, or to share with them a little bit about when I've seen students get anxious before in the past, here's something I found has been really helpful in my classroom. Things like that. The other thing I want to add is a, a disability term here that is, again, universally designed and helpful, is the idea of self-accommodation. So a lot of times students, they may not even have a diagnosis because they've gotten so good at figuring out how to change the world to work with their needs. So mm -hmm. an anxious person may ask you a ton of questions at the beginning of the semester. They may say, well, I already know that I'm going to have to miss class on April 1st, and how am I going to make this stuff up? The readings aren't on black board yet, um, what do you want me to do? And you may be thinking, April 1st? We've got, I don't know what's going on. Why don't you chill out for a minute and let's get to at least spring break here. But that student may have figured out, I know that it, and they may not have even done this consciously, I know that it's going to, by April, I'm going to be really stressed out and I've already identified this issue that I'm going to miss this one class and so I want to deal with that right now while I have some energy and emotional resilience left at this point. So the kindest thing that you can do when someone's, you can tell that they're doing that self-accommodation thing or they're saying, they're asking you things like, um, could we, when we sit in class, can we always sit in the same seats and you're thinking, I don't know, sit wherever you want to. Um, that maybe they're saying to you, it's a lot more helpful for me if I can sit where I can see you the whole time, whether it's because they have hearing loss and they can that way they can hear you better, um, or it's because it helps them stay engaged because they have ADHD, whatever it might be, they might have come up with some of these tools. And so if you can be supportive of those tools, um, rather than thinking that's not how I address things, um, that, that can be really helpful and can help them to form this resilience because that's actually what we want them to be able to do is to self-accommodate to the extent possible. Um, and the other thing that Marilyn um, just whispered in my ear is to talk about trust. So I know that I said something earlier about trust. Um, but it's... Um, it's we really, really need to trust our students. And um, so if you can trust the stories that they're telling you, if you go into it thinking that they're lying to you or trying to get one over on you, it's going to cause you a lot of anxiety and them a lot of anxiety. And I know that happens. Believe me, in the Dean of Students office, we've seen it all from fabricated plane tickets. That's like one I remember from my first semester here. So it's not that I think that everyone tells the truth. I just think that if we operate from the paradigm um, that people are essentially liars um, and trying to get away with stuff, it just causes us so much more stress and anxiety. So if we can come at the place of, I trust you, I care about your story, but then also to that other piece that I said at the beginning is you can have expectations. So don't say, oh sure, you missed two months of class, no problem, as long as you finish the final paper, you can still get an A in this class. If that doesn't feel right to you, if that doesn't meet your outcomes, um, and it depends on your course, um, then you can design alternative assignments and you can design that flexibility in there so you can still have expectations. Um, but coming at it, if we don't turn ourselves all into mini detectives in CSI, I think that we'll save ourselves some time. John? Thank you. Um, it, it strikes me that there's an overarching theme that comes to mind in, in a lot of the comments we've heard of helping students um, to demythologize what it is to yeah. be a, a member of the academy, yeah. um, to demythologize the category of professor. Mm -hmm. And it, it brought to mind for me um, a study whose results I don't think have been published yet, but I heard them at a conference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, writing teachers uh, did a study involving the effects of including what they called one authentic response in each paper. Mm -hmm. Authentic response is a bad phrase. By that they mean a, f a phrase that um, comes from the human and not the teacher. It can be mm -hmm. something like, oh, I like Springsteen too. Mm -hmm. Takes five seconds to write it on every paper. Students had more recall of all the other things that were written on the paper mm -hmm. when the paper included one reference mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. That's neat. It, it's a, it, it, it was stunning to hear and then commonsensical when one thought of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, it's, it's not that we need to, you know, pull open the curtains and develop a kind of inappropriate, you know, intimacy mm -hmm. with our students, but if they can learn better by knowing that I saw Springsteen in 78, by God, I'm going to yeah. spend the five seconds and write that. 
I love that, John. And I would just add, as a, as a fan of something called social cognitive theory, modeling is the most powerful impact that any one individual has for learning. So if your students feel that you have empathy for them because there's something that they really say, oh, this person and I really get each other, that, that can be the, the moment that turns for them and their ability to tolerate distress significantly changes. That's what I would say is at the heart of most therapy that we do with college students is the ability for that person to say, oh, everybody else is a human too. And I think that that's really part of what you're speaking to. And I'd love to that's see that, that study. Just to add to that, there is literature in, on modeling that <clears throat> if you're trying to get someone to overcome resistance to change, if you're a, what is called a coping model where you share something, say, that was hard for me at one point, mm -hmm. too, versus a what's called a mastery model where you're more authoritarian. Mm -hmm the individual is more likely to push through that resistance and difficulty. Mm -hmm. So, okay. same thing. Yes, interesting. Rose? Hi. Um, well, I know the panel mentioned this briefly, but we've talked about the person that's mm. asking for accommodations. What about the perception of fairness in your classroom? For those that are meeting standards and not asking for extra time or extra help, how do we mitigate sort of the resentfulness that other students might feel toward others? Okay, so I'll speak to that on two different planes. One from the disability perspective. So someone has an accommodation. And when we determine an appropriate accommodation, the idea is not to give an advantage, but to give a level playing field. So um, that those are thoughtful decisions that are made based on someone's uh, records based on someone's explanation of, uh, of what's going on with them. And so those, those decisions are, we're looking actually at is time and a half to student A equal to regular or flat time um, for another student? So if, so I would say that's it, the accommodation question is a bit easier because it's it's been a thoughtful determination. Um, if a student is asking for something outside of that process, so they're just asking for some flexibility, and I think actually in both cases, um, the universal design again pulls in because then you want to ask yourself what is it about taking this an exam in an hour and a half that actually matters am i judging so at, at one point i worked at a medical school and this became this was very interesting talking about it from a disability perspective because in a few of the courses time really mattered so in an emergency room kind of course where you're talking about emergency medicine I don't care what the disability is, time matters. So you need to be evaluated to some degree on time. For a lot of the courses that we're um, doing, time actually is not a huge factor in it. So you may want to think if that's a big issue for you to think about and you're worried about the fairness, um, you may want to think about is a take-home exam where time is actually not the issue here, um, is, is that a better way to do this exam? Um, are there other ways to do um, to show the knowledge in a way that people can pick the option. So they can say, I'm going to either take the exam or I'm going to give the presentation um, so that it's not based on the why, but, it, but it's an, a set of options that you've determined to be fair. Does that answer your question, Rose? Well, I guess, um, I'm very supportive of accommodations because I understand why they're done and I recognize that. But I, I do hear from other students from time to time about how they feel that others are getting advantages, even though what you just uh, said suggests that it isn't an advantage. But I, I, I wanted to know if you had strategies to sort of uh, help the student that feels like, hey, I'm working my butt off here, and I'm not getting extra treatment or extra special. How do I curtail the, the mm -hmm. fallback I might hear from that student? Yeah, so I would say one thing is you want to find out from them what they need, because it may be if they if they don't feel like they can complete the exam in the time that's allotted, there may be an undiagnosed issue that's going on with them. Um, I would also say you're welcome to refer that student to the Academic Support and Access Center to find out about the policies and procedures that we have. So sometimes just a little bit more knowledge in terms of what does it take to be documented. We're obviously not going to say, oh, you're right, Sally in your class gets time and a half. Here's why we decided that. Um, but we, I think sometimes when students find out what policies and procedures are, they can feel open about it. And then also to and this is a little bit what we were just talking about, is to talk to them about things in your life maybe that haven't seemed fair but actually are fair. So um, whether it's the way that we tax people in the United States, and sometimes that feels fair and unfair, um, there, there are things that on the surface often feel um, that creating total fairness, if that is the goal, 
um, that's a different goal than a, a supportive educational environment. And again, I would, I would say that having this conversation at the start of the semester can be beneficial, giving students some sense of what your definition of fairness is. So to that student in private, you might be able to say, is there something in this course that you need from me that you don't feel you're getting? It may be a matter of, well, he got that, but I didn't get anything. I just or, want, oh yeah. yeah, I wanted to add one more thing is that you can also flip the conversation with the student and say, talk to me about why this is feeling so unfair to you and talk more about their feeling of fairness um, because I bet it's not just coming from a place of I'm really mad that Sally gets extra time. Um, to, to have an intellectual conversation with them about fairness might be a, an interesting route to go with them. Chip? Um, one, one quick comment on that. I think one of the things that I try to tell my classes and also my staff and everybody that I work with um, is that uniformity and fairness are two very different mm, things. That's Great a good point. point. And I think all too often institutions and individuals in our practices hide behind uniformity because it allows us to not make difficult qualitative mm -hmm. decisions okay. that are part of what it is to be human. And I'm consistently disappointed at policies that force us to be uniform at the expense of fairness. Um, so I refuse to do so. I'm, an, I'm a conscientious objector on that on that point. <laughs> but the, but the other the other point is that I, I think in my years of teaching I've changed radically in my view of examinations. And one of the things that I have been trying to do in my classes here is to de-stress the exam in the way I approach it. So when are we going to have it? Let's talk about when it's best for everybody. I no longer do them in the classroom. I have them proctored um, in the language center, and I allow the students to do them at any point in time during that week, mm. depending on what they have due and what they have to do. And then I give them all a speech about the fact that even though you may not believe it, even if you don't do well on this exam, your life is not ruined. Mm -hmm. And I do that That's regularly right. throughout the semester because for some reason we, and I mean me too, but whatever we are as a society, we have created these highly stressed 18-year-olds when, when I went to college, I had a lot of fun and managed to learn. And we've killed that. And I don't know why we've killed it. I don't know how we've killed it. But we've killed it. And they shouldn't be so stressed that they can't learn because they won't learn if they're that stressed. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's very good. I didn't mean to run yet, and you can vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make Thank a point you. that what you're really demonstrating there with your philosophy is, is high support but high expectations. Mm -hmm. Those are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think we can get caught in if I, if I want to have more support, then I need to lower my expectations. And in fact, our students really thrive with both of those. So yes, it might feel like, gosh, they need a lot more support than I did when I was in college. In fact, we can keep those high expectations and do that support in, way, in ways that can feel creative and fun. But both of those things can happen at the same time. So thank and you for that. We have time for one last question. Yes. Um, talking about expectations, when we receive um, email from the Dean of Students about students having health issues, is it expected that we approach the student or that the student Good approaches question. us? Good question. Good question. So the question is, when you get the um, mysterious email from the Dean of Students <laughs> office saying that there's an issue, some issue, um, with a student and that they're going to need some flexibility, when I write those emails, I try to specifically put where the expectation is. And I always leave it with the student, actually. So I always say, the student will come to you about a plan to get back on track. And I put and I talk to the student. And actually, I write the emails in my office with the student um, and read it to them before we send it to the faculty member. Um, and any emails that I get back from the faculty member, unless it's something confidential or private, I forward on to the student and say, you need to have the same information that I do so that you can come up with this plan. So um, the, um, the st and a lot of times I'll hear from faculty saying, you know what, I never heard from this student. Mm -hmm. And um, I can factor that in in my case management with the student. So I can, if I'm meeting with the student regularly, I can say, I thought you were going to go meet with this faculty member. What happened here? And then I might get back to you and say, Ugh, let me tell you a little bit more. They're going to come at this time. Or maybe I'll realize that when I was talking to the student, we didn't get concrete enough about how they were going to approach you. Um, but then sometimes students are flaky. Um, and if they're flaky, that's not on you. That the, You were alerted. You were open to me. Um, and so sometimes when faculty can write back things like, 
I'd love to see you. My next office hours are at Tuesday at 2.30. Please come by. That's above and beyond. That's fantastic because then that, again, makes something abstract like I will help you to something concrete. Come at 2.30. Um, so that's really helpful, but it is not on you to then go to your syllabus and start saying, well, maybe they, if they did this and if they did this and then they could do this by this date, that's a lot of work for you to do. Um, and, and I at least don't expect that when I'm sending those emails. Okay. Um, thank you to our panel for being with us today. Uh, thanks to all of you. If you have suggestions, like the books you mentioned, or want more information and more resources, please email us um, at CTRL, and we will get back to you. Thank you all very much.